In the late 2000s, I embarked on a career in teaching, landing a position at a middle school in a bustling Midwestern city. Little did I know that my journey into education would take an unexpected and terrifying turn. Teaching proved to be a relentless challenge, with understaffed classrooms and limited resources. The middle school students, in all their adolescent complexity, wielded a capacity for cruelty that caught me off guard. Amid the chaos of my new profession, loneliness became my constant companion. The desire to find love, however elusive, still lingered in the corners of my mind. Enter, Plenty of Fish, an online dating platform that beckoned to me like a beacon of hope. I created a profile, striving to strike a balance between genuine and intriguing. As I sifted through the myriad profiles of local singles, I couldn't help but feel overwhelmed by the attractive, enigmatic women who populated the site. My attempts to connect with them often ended in disappointment. But then, just when I was on the brink of giving up, a message arrived from an intriguing woman named Lyra. Lyra, a petite Hispanic with captivating amber eyes and a penchant for curly brown hair, seemed charming and intelligent. We quickly exchanged email addresses, eager to delve into deeper conversations. Lyra's interests were a blend of the ordinary and the peculiar. While she worked as a waitress and had an eye for fashion, her true passion lay in a subject that set her apart, serial killers. Strangely, this macabre fascination intrigued me rather than repelled me. It was something we could bond over, or so I thought. As our conversations evolved, so did our connection. We shared photos, some more daring than others but never crossing into explicit territory. I found her captivating, and she reciprocated with compliments about my looks. It wasn't long before we made plans to meet in person. The day arrived, a Sunday afternoon bathed in anticipation. I drove to the Starbucks in her neighborhood, parked my car facing the strip mall, and waited. Our rendezvous was scheduled for 2 p.m., but as the minutes ticked away, a sense of unease crept over me. I sent a text, and she assured me she was just minutes away. Restlessly, I waited, my eyes scanning the surroundings. Then, a stranger appeared on the horizon, approaching the parking spaces. I watched, assuming he was headed to one of the adjacent cars, but he halted in front of my car. He was slightly younger than me, with dark eyes, a trimmed beard, and a mustache framing his mouth. My initial reaction was curiosity, but my unease grew as he pulled out a small digital camera and began snapping pictures of me. I stared at him incredulously, but honking my horn did nothing to deter him. I rolled down my window, intending to confront him, but as soon as I did, he leaned closer and whispered words that sent chills down my spine. I don't think you want to make a scene here, he began. You don't want people to find out you've been talking to my 17-year-old sister, especially not the school board. Has anyone ever said anything to you that made your whole self freeze for a moment? The world around me seemed to stand still as his words sank in. I'd been tricked, catfished, and now held captive to a sinister game. The dread that enveloped me was indescribable, akin to the moment I learned of my father's sudden passing, a suspended moment where everything else carried on without me. My blackmailer had me firmly in his grip, and I knew he had the power to destroy my life. I was trapped between the threat of exposure and the chilling possibility of imminent danger. Over the weeks that followed, he drained me of thousands of dollars, exploiting my fear and desperation. Every exchange reminded me of my vulnerability. I had no choice but to pay, for he had threatened my life. I couldn't bear the thought of suddenly losing everything I'd worked for, simply because I couldn't meet his demands. As time passed, I mustered the courage to revisit my conversations with Lyra, 
realizing that the young woman I thought I knew was a complete fabrication. I wasn't talking to a 17-year-old girl, I wasn't even sure if the girl in the pictures was real. My blackmailer had manipulated my trust, and I needed to find a way out. Ultimately, I decided to take matters into my own hands and seek help from the authorities. I met with detectives who specialized in extortion cases, and they assured me that my case was far from the most embarrassing they'd encountered. I wasn't alone in facing the sinister realm of blackmail. The path to justice was murky, but I couldn't let fear dictate my fate any longer. I testified against my blackmailer in court, hoping for closure and redemption. However, justice is a double-edged sword. Though my blackmailer was arrested, my own life took a devastating turn. A package containing manipulated evidence and predatory accusations arrived at every school in the district, and my career teetered on the precipice of ruin. Despite the detective's intervention, the school board's judgment was unforgiving. I faced an impossible choice, resign with a clean recommendation or be forcibly ousted, forever bearing the stain of false accusations. My life has since taken many twists and turns. The scars of this ordeal run deep, casting a long shadow over my attempts to rebuild. Yet, I hold on to hope that one day, I'll overcome the trust issues that haunt me and find the love I know I deserve. Last year, I had no intention of joining the local neighborhood watch. I already lived in a neighborhood with a homeowners association HOA, and dealing with their micromanagement was more than enough for me. The HOA, with its absurd rules, once forced me to hire a construction company to move my shed by a mere two inches, claiming it violated my contract. The shed sat innocuously in my backyard, behind a fence, exactly where it was when I moved in. I could tell you countless tales of my run-ins with those people, but let's save those horrors for another day. Needless to say, I despised my HOA and wanted nothing to do with the neighborhood watch committee. I may have even made a few ill-advised comments about how I'd rather be robbed than have anything to do with them. Of course, someone overheard my disdain, and that's when my troubles began. Why am I recounting this tale of the neighborhood watch when I wanted to steer clear of it? Well, as fate would have it, that watch would be the reason my family and I remained safe, despite the increasing number of muggings in our neighborhood. I was adamant about not joining, refusing to give them the time of day. I was always wary of people trying to control my life, and the idea of patrolling the streets at night held no appeal for me. I'm no pushover, I frequent the gym and exude confidence. I naively believed I could handle any confrontation, should a robber or mugger be foolish enough to target me. I never considered the possibility of multiple attackers or that they might carry weapons. My arrogance blinded me to the harsh reality that I was just another potential victim. That stubbornness would come at a steep cost. One night, as I walked home from a late shift at work, relishing the peace of the quiet night, I suddenly found myself surrounded by a group of men. The details are hazy, but I knew there were at least five of them. They demanded my wallet and phone, and I knew better than to resist. As I fumbled through my pockets, regret flooded over me for not taking proper precautions. I had always thought I could defend myself, but reality proved me wrong. After robbing me, they delivered a brutal beating, one that left both physical and mental scars. Despite surviving the ordeal, I couldn't shake the persistent fear and paranoia that gripped me. I found myself constantly looking over my shoulder, clutching a pocket knife everywhere I went. One day, while returning from the grocery store, I noticed a man tailing me. My heart raced, cold sweat formed on my forehead, and panic took hold. I quickened my pace, 
and he matched it. I couldn't outrun him, so I turned to confront him. He was a tall, imposing figure with a menacing look in his eyes. What do you want? I asked, trying to maintain a steady voice. He sneered and reached for something in his pocket. That was all the confirmation I needed. I brandished my knife, and the man hesitated before fleeing. I stood there, trembling from adrenaline, realizing I had narrowly avoided another mugging. I couldn't be sure if this encounter was connected to the previous one, as the man had been alone and not accompanied by a gang. Back at home, I was a wreck, replaying the night's events in my mind. My wife did her best to console me, but I was a mental mess. I let our dogs out before bed, and within minutes, their ferocious barking filled the night. I rushed outside to find the same man from earlier, this time joined by two others. I struggled to corral the dogs and get them inside while my wife fled to a locked room, screaming. The burly leader of the trio kicked me hard to the ground as they broke through the back door with minimal effort. I lay on the floor, absorbing a relentless barrage of kicks while trying to get to my feet. My mind raced, hoping that if I endured this beating, my wife might remain unharmed. I had underestimated the dangers I faced, my arrogance convincing me that I could handle anything. Amidst the incoherent yelling and laughter, I heard a grunt and a cry of pain. The kicks abruptly ceased, and I heard a commotion, a struggle. I opened my eyes, slowly rising to my feet. In the backyard, I spotted the leader of my HOA, the head of the neighborhood watch, along with six other residents. Armed with baseball bats, they had taken matters into their own hands. After being struck by the bats, the assailants scrambled over the fence, disappearing into the night. I managed to get to my feet, profoundly grateful for the unexpected assistance. The neighborhood watch leader claimed they had heard my cries for the dogs, which sounded like a dire emergency. They had rallied the neighbors nearby, arriving within minutes. I thanked them profusely, and the leader humbly stated that they were merely doing what any good person would do. They had acted swiftly to protect me and my family. I recently stumbled upon your YouTube channel and found myself engrossed in your videos. Unfortunately, my financial situation is quite dire at the moment, so I can't contribute with a super chat or channel membership. Instead, I thought I'd express my gratitude by sharing a chilling tale from my past, one that unfolded in the eerie depths of Vermont during the late 90s, around 98 or 99, if memory serves. This tale, I assure you, is as true as the darkest of nightmares. In my high school years, there was a peculiar individual named Chris who shared my homeroom. Chris had a knack for hustling, always finding unconventional ways to make a quick buck. I recall one instance when he amassed a small fortune selling counterfeit cassette tapes. I myself purchased Weezer's Pinkerton from his illicit collection. His operation went unnoticed until a teacher was caught red-handed buying one of his tapes, resulting in the teacher's dismissal while Chris merely received a detention. Chris was soon back, peddling loose cigarettes without remorse. However, it was his next venture that truly spiraled out of control. Chris hatched a scheme that pushed the boundaries of morality. Instead of peddling wares that could be traced back to him, he discovered a newfound interest, the school's computer lab and its freshly installed internet access. It appeared that Chris had genuinely turned over a new leaf, or so we thought. The teachers assumed he'd found his calling and left him to his own devices. Rumors circulated that he was building a website, but Chris remained tight-lipped about his online pursuits. Oddly, Chris developed an unexplainable fascination with CB radios. He even had a photograph of one in his locker, 
boasting about his project to assemble the most potent civilian CB radio in the entire United States, piece by piece, in his mother's garage. When questioned about this nerdy endeavor, he claimed it was for the thrill of impersonating lost children in distress over the airwaves, relishing their panic. We dismissed these tales as elaborate fantasies and wondered why he didn't simply use payphones for pranks. Little did we know, Chris was not bluffing, he had a sinister plan. Chris infiltrated internet chat forums frequented by CB radio enthusiasts, adopting the persona of a legitimate traitor. He cleverly used a P.O. box to conceal his identity and communicated exclusively via email, leaving no trace of his true age. Instead of offering cash for the items on sale, he baited unsuspecting traders with promises of rare replacement parts he could supposedly procure. Some fell for his ruse, trading their valuable parts for his phantom promises, only to be met with silence after the exchange. His scheme was cunning, albeit malicious. However, like all deceptive endeavors, it was bound to backfire. One fateful day, Chris collected a package from his P.O. box, expecting another unsuspecting victim's parts. To his surprise, two boxes awaited him. Juggling multiple targets at once, he took both boxes and tossed them in the back seat of his mother's car before driving home to unveil his spoils. Intrigued, his mother watched as Chris opened the boxes. The first contained radio parts, as expected. But the second, a smaller box within, held a nightmarish surprise, a sinister device rigged to explode upon opening. Before their horrified eyes, Chris met a gruesome end, torn apart by the explosive. His mother, too, suffered grave injuries and spent days recovering in the hospital. It was a terrifying lesson for all of us, a grim reminder that the internet was not merely a realm of connection but also a shadowy abyss where malevolent forces lurked. The tale left an indelible mark on my perception of the web, a stark reminder that behind the screen, not everyone is who they claim to be. The internet's power to unite is matched only by its capacity to unleash unimaginable horrors, lurking in the digital darkness, ready to manifest in the real world.